Welcome, my name is Joan Bishop. I'm executive director of the Oli Foundation. And I think it's good to know in case I seem a little excited. May 24th, I'll be celebrating 37 years with Dr. Howard and most of them with the Oli Foundation. So, woohoo. So it's a lovely spring day here in Albany, New York area. And what's better than the weather is knowing that we have over 130 people registered for this important meeting. And uh, we pulled it together quickly. Um, and we just really appreciate um, all of you tuning in. First, I'd like to sketch uh, out a bit about the session. We'll begin by getting acquainted with where we are in moving towards avoiding misconnections. We'll hear from stakeholders, consumers, patients, home company representatives, um, clinicians, product manufacturers are represented in the audience, along with representatives from the FDA, all with an interest in sharing, listening, and learning. We're hoping for as interactive of a session as we can possibly host within the limits of the virtual platform. Now, I was thinking this morning about what I, what I could say, what I would say, and what I should say. And if I were in the audience, I'd, I'd wanna know what Oli's position is. So, and I'm gonna read this so I don't mess it up. Um, the Oli Foundation was founded over 30 years ago to serve home enteral and parenteral uh, consumers, the safety and well being of nutrition support consumers is in the forefront of all that we do. Today, change is seen in the enteral market, specifically the introduction of International Organization for Standardization, ISO standard 80369-3, and new enteral tubing connectors known as ENFIT have the potential to affect both enteral and parenteral consumers. And while enteral consumers are having a mixed reaction um, to the change, both enteral and parenteral consumers may benefit as the risk of tubing misconnections will be reduced and patient safety increased. Oli is aware of several concerns surrounding ISO 80369-DS3 and ENFIT and remains committed to facilitating an open dialogue between consumers, member of industry, the FDA, and the clinical community, and working towards seeing these issues resolved. We also applaud the effort to reduce mis tubing misconnections, which is the stated goal behind this initiative. Does that all make sense? I certainly hope so. So we have a moderator with us today that we are very pleased to have join us. Yeah, I'm looking for my before we get to before we get to Kelly Joan, I would like to offer a few um, words about Zoom and and our how we'll proceed today. Um, so we've set it so that you're you're muted for now everyone should be muted um we also have set it so your cameras are off we did that to protect your privacy and also because we felt it would kind of be cluttered with 120 participants um so one thought about your your privacy is oh, i'm sorry i'm getting off track here Let's see. Right, let me follow the slides. You can go back done. <laughs> um, the mute and unmute settings. So later on, we will have an option to have some discussion. Everybody, I think, is probably familiar with mute and unmute sex. Um, sorry, mute and unmute settings. In the bottom left hand corner of your screen, you should see a microphone icon. If you click on that, a red line will indicate you are muted. We encourage everyone to stay muted. Um, and I think we have you muted during our presentations to avoid background noise. Uh, when it's time, we might invite you to unmute yourself. Um, the next slide shows the bottom, let's see. Yep. At the bottom center of your screen, you'll see a participants icon. 
last time I looked, it showed we had 76 participants. Um, the list will give you a hand raising option. We are not using the hand raising option. We've found it difficult to keep track of it. So if you um, have a question or a comment, please use the chat function. We've got several, several of us watching the chat function. Um, in the participant list, if you, let's see, this will also give you the option to change your name. Um, and it, it gives directions here on the slide. If you hover over your name, you can change it. The, I mentioned this because this is being recorded. If you don't want your name to show up um, in the participant list, or let's see, it would also be if you send a chat, your name will appear as you have it, <clears throat> excuse me, on your screen. So if you don't want your first and last name on there, make sure you change it. And you can pick who you chat with. I think everybody's probably familiar with um, Zoom by this point, but I think that that covers it for me. Again, you're being recorded. Um, if you don't want your presence to be known, then just don't use your name on chat. That's fine. We'll do a couple screenshots, but it won't affect you because it'll be up to speakers. So if anybody has any questions, just shoot them my way. And we'll try to answer them. And now I'm back to you, Joan, to introduce Kelly. Okay, thank you so much, Lisa. Um, our moderator today is, uh, is Dr. Kelly Tappeton, who is professor and head of the Department of Kinesiology and Nutrition at the University of Illinois in Chicago. Dr. Tappeton's research program focuses on intestinal failure, mechanism regulating epithelial function, and patient malnutrition. For these contributions, she's received multiple awards and published over 100 peer-reviewed papers, delivered over 500 invited lectures, some of which were at the OLE annual and regional conferences. Dr. Tappington served as the 33rd president of the American Society for Parenteral and Enteral Nutrition from 2008 to 2009, chair of the Nutrition Metabolism and obesity section of the American Gastroenterology Association Institute from 2009 to 2013, and presently represents the American Society for Nutrition on the Federation of American Societies for Experimental Biology Board of Directors. I'm not sure what she does in her spare time, but Dr. Tappenden has been the editor-in-chief of the Journal for Parenteral and Enteral Nutrition since 2010. Now that seems really impressive, but I think her most important role right now is Kelly is on um, the board of the Ole Foundation. And that to me is, uh, that's, uh, that's a huge uh, contribution to the patient community. So um, I don't know what else we can say but Dr. Tappington, thank you so much for play, for um, sitting in this role today. Thank you, Joan. You know, I can say among my various professional activities, I am so proud uh, to be a trustee of the Oli Foundation uh, and to chair today's summit on enteral connect connectors. Um, you know, this, this session is titled an opportunity for stakeholders to share, listen and learn. Um, and one of the things that we, know about Oli uh, is that is uh, unparalleled in its impact on individuals living with home intravenous nutrition and tube feeding using education, advocacy, and networking. And that's so relevant today because we have a very diverse group today, much as, as all of the Oli meetings are. We have consumers, we have caregivers, we have providers from multiple disciplinaries, each with their own expertise and priorities. We have policymakers from institutions, home care companies, the FDA, and we have multiple industry representatives and manufacturing partners here. And as with any group, particularly diverse groups like this, we all bring our own knowledge, perspective, priorities. In fact, we only sent out a survey uh, just, just within the last couple of weeks, both to consumers and professionals about and fit connectors in preparation for this. And you may be surprised uh, amongst consumers, 
a quarter of consumers that responded, and there were nearly 300, 25% are, are aware of it. Okay, so 25% know about it, but only 43% are fully informed. 12% haven't heard about it. 9% think they think they might have heard about it. And 11% are learning about it. And so we have this broad range where about 40% feel like they know about it, but the rest are aware of it and, and really wanting to learn. Okay, so today is going to be really important about that education portion. And even in the next few minutes, I'm going to be repeating some things that many of you know, but there's this other segment participating today that we want to make sure we're all on the same page. Even amongst professionals, 50% feel fully informed, uh, but 9% haven't heard of it. 7% think they might have heard about it. 17% are eager to learn. 17% are aware of it. So 25% of consumers and 50% of professionals are fully informed. And we know that there are many of you here who are fully informed and have that passion uh, for, for good reasons. And we're going to talk about all of that today. But there's also then the need for us to share, listen, and learn as the title of the summit has been so carefully chosen. When it comes to NFIT Entral Connectors, I think we're at a point where for some people it feels very new and rushed and unacceptably overdue to others. So by way of background, uh, NFIT Entral Connectors are a newly designed medical device system developed to prevent the infusion of enteral formulas. So those that are intended for infusion only into the gastrointestinal tract or gut from being infused into other locations. So think the circulatory system via central line, a peripheral line, the respiratory system via a trach, um, many, many options uh, of other access devices that patients might have uh, wherein enteral formula can be inappropriately administered. Now, does this happen? Um, let me read to you an excerpt from a letter to the editor published in New tradition and clinical practice two and a half years ago. The title is Transition to Safer Enteral Connections Must Happen Now. It's authored by Glenda Rogers, a nurse. These are her words. My daughter Robin was 35 weeks pregnant with my granddaughter when a nurse, believing she was giving parenteral nutrition, connected a ready-to-hang enteral feeding bag to Robin's peripherally inserted central catheter line. Because of the tubing misconnection, Robin and her baby Addison died. You know, I'm, this is a professional situation. The hair on, on my arms is standing up. Imagine the horror, right? After Robin's and Addison's death, my family and I struggled to make some sense of how something like this could happen. After some research, I found that everybody knew tub mis tubing misconnections can and did occur. Of course, given this experience, Glenda's plea in this letter to the editor is to accelerate the transition of NFIT tubes to prevent tubing misconnections and the further loss of life and, and suffering. That's understandable given this experience. Now, Glenda's assertion that tubing mis misconnections could and do occur is not debatable. Actually, you're going to hear from others who have experienced enteral misconnections. Uh, you're going to see data that this happens often and it has for decades. We also know it's underreported because it often gets lost in the category of medical uh, medication complications. So the rationale for NFITS and supporting this effort is based on protecting patients from morbidity and suffer or and mortality, suffering and death from tragic events such as enteral misconnections. That in itself is an altruistic and worthy objective. And Glenda is right. Prevention of these avoidable injuries and death really must be stopped immediately. And after years of talking though, we find ourselves on the cusp of some important deadlines. GEDSA, the Global Enteral Device Suppliers Association made up of multiple industry and organizations uh, have the deadline that July 1st, of 2021, legacy feeding tubes and cross application adapters will no longer be manufactured. January 1st of 
2022, transition sets and adapters sold separately from other devices will no longer be manufactured. So this is upon us. But in reality, for those of you who feel it's not fast enough, um, that will be supported by the fact that these revised deadlines were bumped back a full year from what was originally scheduled due to the COVID-19 pandemic. So for many stakeholders here today, this whole process is delayed. But for others, let me, let me be set, uh, very clear. We know that there are others for good reason uh, feel that this is far too quick. For example, many consumers don't have multiple ports. This isn't an issue, and they've worked very hard to establish a routine, uh, suppliers ordering, that process is in place for them. They have venting and draining issues that won't be addressed with NFIT tubes. There are formulas uh, from various sources and consistencies that that's, will not be optimized uh, based on what their individual needs are. There's cleaning issues. There are a lot of concerns. And please be assured that today we'll hear those concerns. Okay, I also want to assure you, and we'll, we'll talk about that more later, but AMT, Applied Medical Technologies, uh, which is distinct from the Gensa Group, is going to continue to manufacture legacy tubes. So for those of you who have some of these other concerns about NFIT, uh, you know, we, we do want to make sure that, that your concerns are heard and met. Remember, Oli is committed to the safety and well-being of all nutrition support consumers. Uh, it's in the forefront of what Oli does. So these concerns are heard. However, the importance of preventing misconnections while accommodating the needs of the entire Oli community is where the balance is going to be struck today. So this is an open dialogue amongst the variety of individuals that we have here, consumers, caregivers, industry workers, the FDA, clinical community. We want to discuss these unmet needs. We recognize that the reason for having these tubes is of course to prevent, to protect patients, right? Um, but there are also unmet needs uh, that are currently identified, concerns with NFIT tubes. Hopefully we can hear these today uh, that can spur innovation and we can identify solutions. So with that said, we're going to be able to open our time together today um, with uh, a, a video from Stephanie Silverman, a consumer and caregiver. Uh, and Joan, my understanding is that you can give us a bit of an introduction to Stephanie. I will. Um, Kelly and everyone who's joined us, uh, many of you know Stephanie, Stephanie Harlow Silverman and her situation, but Stephanie and her husband both were on HPN. Stephanie also would uh, inf infuse via her too, as well as uh, four of her children at one time. And um, she can best describe some of her experiences, both as a consumer and, and someone who experienced it herself, as well as um, being a parent witnessing um, things happening that are troubling. So there she is. She's unable to join us, although she may be tuned in and watching. Hi, my name is Stephanie Silverman. Um, I am here to talk to you today about some experiences that my family had. I have a family of seven. At one point in time, five of us have been on TPN feedings and six of us on G-tube and or J-tube feedings. So we have had a wealth of experiences and a lot of complications. I Just about everyone, I think we probably had some unique to our family, um, but there's one very specifically that, uh, one complication and one problem we had that I wanna talk to you about today. So when uh, my fourth son was in elementary school, we received a new RN from, at that time we were using agency RNs. We received a new RN and uh, 
I had already gotten everything ready for the day. I'd gotten the TPN ready. I'd gotten his, his tube feeds ready and ready to go and um, with the packing of his backpack. And I had already gone through previous days of, uh, I'd had her in for some training before I'd let her go to school with him. And it was in the morning, we were in a rush and I asked her to take his caraphate, which was already pulled up in a syringe um, to put through his G-tube. Um, at that time, it never occurred to me that a registered nurse would make the mistake she then made, particularly with caraphate, which is only given one way. And it's obvious, it's mixed up, it's a different color. She went to, um, she went into the room and I was coming around the back end just in time to see her pick up his central line and screw the caraphate syringe onto the central line. Stopped her, but, uh, it was shocking to say the least. Um... None, I don't think anything had been um, injected at that point, but had I not been right behind her, there would have been oral caraphate in his central line, um, which I, I don't have to tell any of you, that would be a life-threatening complication. There have been, since that episode, we were much more aware that it could happen. In talking to other parents at that time, it was, I found that it was not an unusual problem that, um, I don't wanna say untrained nurses because these nurses had their RN, these aren't LPNs, these are actual RNs who, uh, and, and most of the friends that we have are very studious about training their nurses. Um, but it happens, um, it happens not, it happens a lot in home health care settings. I think there's less things set up to prevent those kinds of problems from happening. And it makes you as a parent feel like, as you already feel like you have to be on top of everything every second of every day, which is in which no human being can do. But now it makes it even worse. You can't even trust something that I think was very, I thought was very obvious and never could be done. It didn't happen to me personally but I'm amazed at the number of times I was exhausted in the middle of the night doing every four hour antibiotics or mid -time, midnight uh, feeds or medicines or all the things you do when there isn't nursing available because that's another issue is nursing, cri there's, there's a nursing crisis and you can't get good nurses anyway. So parents end up doing a lot of it. It's only by a stroke of luck that I didn't make the same mistake and hurt my own child, which um, I know has happened to others. Um, I've heard it from other uh, nurses in on floors that it happens all the time. I think it's stopped most of the time. I don't know why there isn't more reported about it, but uh, it's a horrible situation. All right, for those of you who are unfamiliar with caraphate, what this is is an oral medication that coats the, uh, the lumen, the, the cells in the stomach and prevents uh, damage from ulcers. So it's not the same medication if you think of Pepto-Bismol or something, a chalky kind of coating solution like that, um, you're along the right, the right line. And putting that into one's bloodstream, of course, um, would be uh, have very negative outcomes. So this fear um, that we've given you some anecdotes or you know individual examples of now, um, I want to turn our attention to a lecture uh, by Dr. Mundi, who will look at some data for us and help us understand the scope of the problem uh, beyond these really important, uh, experiences that we've had from, from individuals so far. So Dr. Mundi completed medical school at the Keck School of Medicine at the University of Southern California and then 
completed an internal medicine residency and fellowship in endocrinology. He then went on and joined Mayo Clinic Division of Endocrinology, initially as an NIH training fellow, uh, where he studied fatty acid metabolism and obesity. And then he stayed on as clinical staff in the area of nutrition with a focus on obesity and malnutrition, as well as home and inpatient nutrition support. He's currently the medical director for the home enteral nutrition program, associate medical director for the home parenteral and enteral program at Medi Mayo Clinic. So he has all things nutrition support when it comes to enteral and parenteral nutrition. And he manages approximately 1,000 patients per year who are on home parenteral and enteral nutrition. Not only that, he is a scholar. And he is a scholar regarding this issue of NFIT. He's conducted research on home enteral nutrition practices and the impact of NFIT connectors on tube feeding flow rates. Uh, importantly, he's also a trustee for the Oli Foundation. Um, it's fun to introduce Dr. Mundi for any of you. I know many of you will ha have known him. I hope you've had the opportunity not only to hear him speak, but also to meet him because he brings a passion to this area um, that is really unparalleled, unparalleled by, by many others. Uh, we're lucky to be able to have him share share these data and and he's brought some objectivity to this area because he has such a diverse group of patients that he works with as you heard over 1000 so he understands um, those who are desperately afraid of misconnections and those that feel like they need to you know they aren't going to be able to have some of the important functions uh, that they had with legacy tubes uh, with that, he's balancing these various issues by using scholarship. And so as editor of JPEN, I'm always pleased when I see a paper by Dr. Mundi and his colleagues come in where they're taking some of these issues, people experiencing the inability to get various blenderized formulas at the same rate through new tubes uh, and, and trying to understand what the limitations there are. Is it the NFIT tube? Uh, is it potentially the blender that's being used or the timing, the recipe, identifying all these things so that we can find solutions um, that's, that's going to enable moving forward in a way that meets everyone's needs. So now let's hear some data from, from Dr. Mundi on this important issue. Thank My you. name is Manpreet Mundi. I'm currently the medical director of home enteral nutrition here at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. I'm also a member of the OLI board, and I've been given the task to talk to you about what is NFIT, and I think more importantly, why NFIT, or really the ISO 80369-3 standard. And I don't have any disclosures that are pertinent to this talk, and I think that's very important. Um, really, a lot of the testing that was done was on a volunteer basis. Uh, I didn't receive any grants from uh, industry and don't consult uh, with any industry pertaining to NFIT or this standard. Uh, these are my uh, research grants and then I'm also on the advisory board uh, for a number of organizations. Um, so really, uh, why a new connector? And this goes back to misconnections. Uh, the main issue here is uh, that when a patient is hospitalized, they can be connected to countless catheters and tubes, et cetera, for different delivery systems, such as IV fluids, uh, Foley catheters for urine removal, uh, enteral tubes, um, et cetera. And so this complexity of medical care is quite prone to tube misconnections. And essentially, these are where um, a tube that's intended for one use, such as enteral nutrition, is misconnected to a tube intended for another use, such as an IV. And this can have dire consequences. Most of the time, the consequences are manageable, uh, such as the example from Mayo, uh, where um, one of our nurses flushed the balloon port as opposed to uh, the G port, 
uh, causing the balloon to rupture and having the tube fall out. The tube can be put in you know, immediately and, and salvage that insertion site. But in other cases uh, that have been reported in literature, unfortunately, um, you know, this can lead to really severe consequences for the patient, especially death. Uh, and that is what is leading to um, this change. And one of these earliest cases of misconnection um, was reported in the 70s where milk uh, that was to be given into the stomach was accidentally given through an IV. A uh, patient developed a severe hypersensitivity event, right, and uh, had coagulopathy, but they, they survived. Um, but in other cases, as, as present in this report, uh, there have been many uh, reports of misconnections with 21 deaths and, again, numerous other serious consequences being reported. And obviously, there's way more than 116 um, misconnections. These are just what are the severe ones that are reported in literature. Um, we think many of these are being managed internally with additional education uh, and discussion, etc. And so uh, the Joint Commission is seeing this, the FDA is seeing this, and so with that, um, you know, there's been real push uh, to move forward with a redesign of these standards. And again, you know, when we talk about NFIT, really what we're discussing about is a trade name for a certain number of tubes that meet this standard. And the standard is ISO 80369. And if we step back, really the International Organization for Standardization, that's what ISO stands for, um, you know, we've developed an ISO 80369 standard that applies to all small bore connections. And as you can see here, this includes respiratory, enteral, urologic, such as fo uh, Foley's, limb cuff, neuraxial, intravascular, right? And so we just happen to be one of the first ones to make this transition. So the dash three applies to enteral. The next that's coming and that's been approved and finalized is the neuraxial, the dash six. So that's going to be implemented soon. And then as, as things continue, intravenous, respiratory, right? And so right now as we're making this transition, you know, there's been many reports that you can still take and fit and jam it into an IV or a trach, et cetera. But again, the plan is to move forward with transitioning all of them to prevent misconnections. And this is the website, iso.org, for your reference where you can go and actually um, take a look at the entire standard uh, that's there. But just keep in mind that NFIT, when we talk about it, is really a trade name uh, for a certain set of tubes that meet this standard. Now, there can be other manufacturers who develop their own standards uh, that, uh, I'm sorry, their own tubes that meet this standard as well. Uh, so just keep that in mind. But again, um, you know, the Global Enteral Device Supplier uh, Association, GEDSA, uh, has been tasked to, to make this transition. So it's, it's composed of a number of uh, manufacturers and other uh, groups that, that will, will help with this transition. And for NFIT, really the transition has occurred um, going from uh, away from the patient as, as this is the tube going into the patient. So away from the patient, starting with the enteral supplies uh, that you're seeing there, including the syringes, uh, and the gravity bags, et cetera. So starting uh, there uh, with making those transitions first and then moving towards implementation of the tubes themselves um, to, to kind of make this in a stepwise transition. So temporarily as the supplies were coming on board, we had this Christmas tree adapter that was being used to make sure uh, that, you know, the, the supplies, the the gravity bags, the syringes were, uh, that were designed for, for NFIT 
were compatible with the legacy tubes until we saw uh, that more and more organizations could make this uh, transition. And uh, again, just going back to that concept of patient safety as to the reason of why we're making this transition, right? The, the California um, uh, law um, um, kind of raised this concern. FDA raised the concern. Joint Commission has definitely raised this concern and are even asking hospitals what is their plan to prevent uh, misconnections. But obviously, there's, there's been a huge delay in implementation. Um, and I think part of the reason has been the, compl the complexity of the enteral practice. Uh, and this study just highlights one of those complexities in the numbers we're dealing with. And so this was a study we did uh, using 2013 Medicare data. Uh, we looked at the prevalence of enteral and parenteral nutrition in the United States. Uh, we partnered with three at that time, three of the biggest infusion companies. There's been mergers since then. Uh, but by, by sort of, you know, estimating from that Medicare data, we, we estimated that about 437,000 Americans were on enteral nutrition at home. Uh, at that time, 25,000 were on parenteral nutrition. And this was almost a doubling compared to previous work by Dr. Howard uh, in the 90s. Um, of, of the use of enteral nutrition at home and was one of the higher prevalences uh, in the world. But one, you know, we have thousands and thousands of patients on enteral nutrition, but then there's severe, significant variability in how enteral nutrition is used, right? One, it can be used for enteral nutrition to meet the patient's nutritional needs, whether it's all of it or, or some of it. Um, it can also be used for medication administration, uh, fluids, right? We have some patients who are able to eat enough to meet their nutritional needs, but because their diet is thickened or other limitations, they can't meet their medication or fluid needs, so have to use tubes for that. Others are receiving feedings into their jejunum and need to vent their stomach, right? So venting is another complexity. And then we look at, well, where is that nutrition being provided? Is it in the hospital? Is it at a care facility? Is it at home? Again, who's doing the provision? Uh, how much experience do they have with tubes? Uh, how much education did they receive when they're doing this at home? Right? There's all of these other variables that go into it. Then we look at how the feeding is provided. You know, it could be through gravity with bags, uh, with... Uh, syringe feeding, uh, using a pump, and there's now other devices that are coming out that can also uh, provide without the need of pump, right? So that also adds a layer of complexity to this. Uh, and then we haven't even gotten into what formula you're providing, right? Each of these formulas have different viscosities. There's a whole category of formulas within that standard polymeric category uh, that'll have different viscosities, different concentrations. Uh, all that adds to the complexity. There can be other products that are coming on now, like Complete Organic, Peptide Base has been there for a while. And we learned as part of kind of this implementation that there's also a blenderized tube feeding. Um, we, especially here at Mayo, didn't really, you know, register that this was occurring as commonly uh, as we thought. So early on, uh, we did a lot of surveys of our patients and found that the majority were using blenderized tube feeding in some capacity. Uh, we partnered with Oli to do uh, another survey and found that the vast majority of Oli members were using blenderized tube feeding, right? And so that also adds another layer of complexity because they're blending this at home with different consistencies and different thicknesses. So, um, you know, we sat back and looked at all of these variables, looked at the hundreds of thousands and said, you know, are we going to be able to meet the needs of our patients as we move forward? Uh, in terms of medication administration, uh, you know, get some is doing a lot of the testing uh, for this um, uh, to make sure that medications could be administered safely. And I'll go back to this picture just to show you because the big difference that was occurring 
was that we were transitioning from syringes with this male end going into a, a female legacy end to something that looked like this, kind of a male end going into also somewhat of a male end, uh, right? And with this transition, what was happening was that medications for very small doses were having significant variability. So testing had to be done to make sure we knew how much medication was being provided as this really mattered for our younger patients, right, for babies. Um, and so Getza was doing a lot of this uh, testing. So we felt comfortable there that they, they would be able to uh, account for that and, and adjust the doses that would be provided. Well, what about the rest of the home, you know, enteral population, right? Could could we still do gravity feeds with our patients and, and would the flow rate be affected? Could we do syringe feeding? Could we do blenderized tube feeding? So we needed to make sure all of this was rigorously tested before uh, we ourselves, uh, you know, implemented this. Uh, and early on, uh, we got a hold of some prototypes. Again, these were prototypes and not the ones that were going to go on market. And we, you know, devised ways that we could test flow rates. And so using uh, these syringes and kind of filling them with the uh, same amount of uh, volume and then measuring the time it took to provide that. And we did this and we started to see that, hey, you know, one of the, the prototypes, um, the flow rate was significantly higher um, compared to the other prototype, which was pretty close to the legacy. So something was awry there. And, and this is a 24 French, 20 French low profile, right? We also uh, then uh, met with our orthopedics group because they had this machine that could measure um, the amount of force it took to break a bone. Uh, and we said, hey, you know, can we put a syringe through there and measure the force it takes to compress that syringe? So we did some testing, it worked. And then we were able to test the prototypes um, you know, for this. And we found that, you know, as, as we increased kind of the viscosity, we saw that um, the force needed to compress that syringe was higher. Uh, and with NFIT, the, the prototypes we had to test, we've, we saw that the, there was increased force. And so with this, then came uh, the Oli Summit in 2015. And to me, I think this is where I really saw kind of the power of OLE uh, and the importance of the OLE uh, Foundation in acting as kind of uh, advocate for consumers on enteral and parental nutrition. Uh, we went to the summit and here's, here's me and uh, Dr. Ryan Hurt, my partner in this practice, uh, Joan, you know, as well as other uh, providers that were there. I didn't want to take too many screenshots. I got these uh, from YouTube uh, yesterday, uh, and, and you can still go and watch uh, the YouTube video. It's there, uh, kind of reliving uh, five, uh, six years ago uh, what took place. But really, Oli was able to gather manufacturers, consumers, FDA, healthcare providers, put them in a room, you know, and discuss what the issues were so that we can, again, have better tubes and better outcomes for our consumers. Um, I really felt that this was such a key role for Oli and, and the importance of Oli to stay neutral and advocate, uh, you know, for, for the safety and benefit of, of our consumers. Um, and the, what came out uh, from that uh, was that the FDA and our, our group uh, here at Mayo Clinic, we met and then we worked on developing um, testing that would sort of satisfy us in terms of, um, you know, meeting the needs of our consumers. And so we really set forth to do a few tests. One of them was, again, that flow rate, making sure that now that we had tubes that were going to market as opposed to the prototypes, would the flow rate be adjusted? And, you know, obviously we didn't take any grant money. Um, a lot of this was done with volunteers. And here you're seeing uh, Jacob, who was actually an undergrad and volunteered for the summer to do some research. And we said, hey, you know, this is a perfect project for you. Um, Wanda Duhlman at the time was a dietitian in our home mental nutrition team, uh, and then Lisa Epp. And so here, you know, Jacob is loading the formula, 
Wanda is doing the, the measurements and then Lisa is recording. So uh, quite an effort to do all of the testing we needed. They're smiling just, just as proof that, uh, you know, this wasn't uh, kind of forced in dendritude or something like that. <laughs> um, so uh, we did a lot of testing, got a lot of formula, and Oli and uh, Getza was instrumental in getting us these formulas, we did every test in triplicate and averaged those just again to make sure there weren't any sort of erroneous readings. Uh, and what we saw was that for the 14 French, overall not bad, except there was this one tube, we called it E1. And again, all of this was blinded. So, uh, you know, when, when I, we were doing the data analysis and I was putting this together, I had no idea which tube was which, again, to make sure there was no bias put in there. Um, and so you saw that with E1, the flow rate was lower. And so this overall lowered the flow rate for the, the categorical NFIT versus legacy. But it was really this one, one tube that had flow rate issues. Uh, for the 18 French, we found no big differences. 20 French, same thing. 24 French NFIT tubes were lower. And, and we expected this. We just didn't expect it for the 14 French. Uh, for the 24, obviously, it's a bigger bore. Uh, we knew that with the constraints of kind of the design of, of NFIT and in order to meet this ISO standard, that for the bigger uh, French sizes, we would see a, a decrease in that flow uh, rate. The FDA, again, uh, did similar testing. We overlapped some of the formulas, but we made sure that others were not repeated. So this way, we got uh, even a wider breadth of formulas covered, um, and, and you can see the formulas they use. They've also published this. Lead author is Subhajyoti Gova, uh, Gua, and we worked uh, with him hand in hand in kind of designing these trials. Lots of uh, phone calls back and, and forth, um, and they also noticed uh, again similar results that 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 14 French tube uh, was leading to the the entire category having higher uh, feeding times. And what they did was they just took uh, the amount of formula you could provide in 20 minutes with Legacy and how long would it take uh, for NFIT to then uh, provide that. Uh, and, and you can see as we got into some of the 18 French, et cetera, some of the times were actually less than 20 minutes. So kind of keep that in mind, uh, except for this 14 French, I, I think, again, partly due to that too. So here's more. Uh, so this was... Uh, you know, there were. This was where they had the final uh, readings, and they basically mentioned um, again that uh, decrease in flow rate was observed for most uh, at the 14 French at the larger sizes. Uh, there were significant differences, uh, but NFIT resulted in both increases and decreases in flow rate. So keep that in mind. Uh, then we looked at the force. Um, you know, the syringe force to, to see. And at this point, uh, obviously, uh, BTF uh, was a big player in this. So this gave us an opportunity to look at the force it took to compress the syringe with different formulas of different viscosities, as well as um, the Mayo Clinic recipe. This is something we were using. It was complete nutrition recipe. Uh, we were giving this to patients who wanted uh, an idea of how to do blenderized tube feeding. But it gave us an opportunity to also test different blenders as well and to test blending time, whether that made a difference as well in this. And again, happy researchers, uh, you know, going away, making these formulas, uh, a lot of testing. You can imagine, you know, how, how much it takes to measure all of, all of these. It was quite time. Uh, um, it took a lot of time. Um, and again, uh, so with Jevity, what we actually saw was that overall no big difference, except in the 20 French, it actually took less force uh, with NFIT than it did uh, with the legacy tubes. Um, here's Nourish. Again, we did wide uh, amount of testing, no, big, no main differences. Um, with uh, thicker formulas like real food blends, again, no main difference, except, you know, it did reach the maximum pressure of our machine uh, for the 14 uh, French tube. Uh, so, so something to keep in mind. Uh, we then started to do our own recipe at the tubes at three minutes of blend time, six minutes of blend time, 
Uh, you can see the blenders there, B1 with legacy NFIT. So just a lot of testing uh, that was uh, done here. And I'll go through those uh, slides quickly to kind of get to um, the summary uh, slide, which really showed, again, that finding that I mentioned of lower force needed with NFIT. Uh, at the, the Mayo recipe, the blenderized tube feeding, uh, the NFIT did require higher uh, force. Um, but then, because we had all these variables, uh, you know, we worked with our statisticians on how could we create models that could allow us to assess, you know, what made a bigger difference. Was it the formula that we used? Was it the tube size? Uh, was it actually the legacy versus NFIT? And each time we ran these models, we saw that the legacy versus NFIT fell out. It mattered more the tube size we used or the formula we used than it did uh, you know, the legacy versus NFIT. Uh, again, same thing for our recipe. You know, because we had all the different variables of blend time, the blender used, the tube size, um, each time we ran the model, we saw the same thing. The tube size, blender, time were all significant, but whenever you added those variables, legacy versus NFIT fell out. FDA did their own trial, and again, did two different tests, more, more than even us. One, they, they measured the force, just like us, but then they also looked at um, gravity feeding of blenderized tube feeding, just to see if someone was using blenderized tube feeding in this way, you know, could it be done and what would be the impact? Uh, obviously, this is a lot thicker formulas than, you know, what we did the flow testing with uh, which were the commercially available formulas. And so uh, when when they looked, you know, and published their results, they did find that when you did gravity feeding of blenderized tube feeding, um, that, uh, you know, it would take uh, longer uh, to, to provide that feeding, especially at the large bore sizes. Uh, they found little uh, change to feeding time for the lower uh, sizes. Uh, again, that makes sense given the, the constraints of the design. Then they did uh, the force measurements. And again, they also added another variable here. Um, with our machine, we just had the same, um, you know, pressure, the same uh, time of feeding for all of our measurements. Whereas this machine could be adjusted um, for different uh, measurements. Uh, in terms of time. So when they did a 60 second push, they actually found that less effort was required with the NFIT tubes compared to the legacy tubes. Almost 61% as much force. Uh, but for fast pushes, especially when it got as fast as five seconds, more force would be necessary. So um, with the low-profile uh, tubes, they also had similar findings, uh, again, with less effort uh, uh, with the NFIT compared to the legacy tubes. Um, and so they, again, final summary was that assuming that patients uh, do not intentionally create extremely thick diets uh, or do not push very fast, um, they concluded that most push mode users will not require significantly more force to push their diets through uh, NFIT devices. So with all of these testing done over months, analyzing the data, talking to the FDA, comparing our data, presenting that data, publishing that data, uh, we really felt that we had done a lot of the testing for our patients uh, and that, you know, transitioning to this ISO standard um, of which NFIT tubes were the more readily available, um, you know, would meet the needs of our patients. So in 2018, uh, we at Mayo Clinic then started the process of transitioning to NFIT. Um, and again, I unfortunately don't have the data to present here, but we are collecting data. Uh, COVID-19 pandemic obviously has delayed some of this work. Um, but we are collecting data on complications, phone calls, healthcare utilization, et cetera, before the transition for our enteral patients and then after uh, the transition. 
And so once we collect uh, this data and analyze it, uh, we should be able to share that uh, with you as well at future meetings. Um, but anecdotally, we have not seen a big difference in our practice uh, with this implementation. Where obviously we have seen uh, uh, issues is with venting. And I think we're going to have other speakers as well uh, talk to us about this. And again, going back to the previous OLE Summit uh, in December of 2015, I think this is where, you know, the power of OLE and the importance for OLE, and, and I hope uh, no one minds me saying we when I talk about OLE because uh, I just love the organization and, and the work that it does. Um, really, you know, this is where, uh, again, we're now getting together um, with many folks having uh, transition to NFIT to hear uh, what are the issues they're having, uh, and then to partner with uh, industry uh, to work on developing uh, solutions, um, you know, that, that we can implement for the patients whose needs aren't being met. Uh, I again think that overall uh, the benefit of all of these small board connectors transitioning is just tremendous. It's, it's going to save lives. We know that. It's going to prevent what we, we consider in healthcare morbidity, meaning bad outcomes uh, for patients. So I think the benefit's there. We just now have to keep redesigning and designing better tubes to make sure that all the hundreds of thousands of patients out there that are on enteral uh, feeding, um, that we're able to meet their needs and then make sure you know they continue to have the quality of life that we want them to. Uh, so I, I think this is where Oli has uh, formed a group, uh, you know, uh, within itself of key members of consumers, healthcare providers, um, you know, experts in the field. Um, to, to make sure that all of these needs are met uh, and uh, making sure that we s remain neutral uh, with this implementation so that everyone feels comfortable coming to us and openly sharing uh, these concerns. And so uh, one of the key um, is, is, you know, uh, uh, gets us plan uh, for this implementation, especially looking at some of the deadlines uh, where legacy feeding tubes and uh, adapters will no longer be manufactured. Uh, transition sets and adapters uh, obviously will not be manufactured after January. Um, uh, so this, this obviously will hasten uh, the transition for many organizations. And uh, we, again, uh, want to have an open discussion about what are the remaining issues and then work with our manufacturers uh, to make sure uh, that we can meet those needs. Uh, so uh, with that, uh, I thank you again for uh, this opportunity and the time. Thank you, Dr. Mundi. I'm, I'm wondering if Dr. Mundi has been able to join us yet. Um, if, if anyone knows, I would, would love to hear about that. Um, what we will do, though, prior to opening it up for some questions that any of you might have with him, is look at some of the questions that and comments that came up into the chat area. Um, I will start that. I'm just trying to look at both places here. Uh, let me start. It seems Dr. Mundi isn't here yet. So Anne has said, I'm curious why uh, it was chosen to change the connections for enteral tubes rather than changing the connections for other lines, IV central lines. Um, and, and, and that's a great question. And you may have actually asked it prior to Dr. Mundi's explanation of that in his lecture. Um, the ISO 80369, the International Organization for Standardization, actually is adjusting many of these different types of, of devices. Uh, the, the three stands for enteral, uh, and it's on the leading edge uh, with the six that stands for uroaxial. Um, but there are also changes that are underway for respiratory, urological, and other types of tubes too. So this isn't something that's unique to enteral, enteral connections. This is something that's recognized as being a problem uh, for a variety of these different devices. Now, uh, Neil has said, I thought that European countries have been way ahead of the US regarding this transition. Uh, and we're fortunate to have 
Mike Cusack with us um, from GEDSA, uh, who has answered and said that the European Union is approaching 100% conversion and has been substantially converted for about four years with no known adverse events uh, involving ANFIT. That's also true for Australia and New Zealand. Japan has completed its transition to uh, the NFIT or the NRFIT connector, neuroaxial and nerve blocks, and is midway through the switch to NFIT. And so, Neil, that does confirm that, in fact, uh, North America is, is behind other areas of the world. Uh, and one of the reasons why GEDSA, uh, as was just represented by, by uh, Mr. Kuzak uh, actively supports advancing the adoption, um, as, as you've heard. But that's a bit of a job. Kimberly has shared that uh, and asked, are there any efforts to make hospitals more aware of NFIT? I was just released from a long hospital stay and they did not have compatible syringes and no one had even heard of NFIT. Um, Kimberly, my daughter is a nurse and I asked her last night, she, she had not heard from NFIT either. Um, Kimberly goes on to say, my family had to bring in supplies from home to use during my stay. This is very concerning to me. Are hospitals and other healthcare institutions going to be required to get these in stock? Um, and, and, you know, I think that Kimberly, your comments here underlie part of the anxiety with these, these deadlines that are coming up very quick, but also the part of the concern given this effort has been going on for multiple years. So in the chat, um, Neil shared with us, uh, let me just get to that right point. Um, Neil shares, these transitions have been an uphill struggle. Many institutions will be in for a rude awakening once the legacy tubes go away. Um, the Joint Commission, when they visit and accredit a hospital will demonstrate that they are do something. We'll have, they'll have to demonstrate that they're do something. However, the FDA and Joint Commission will approve any connector that prevents misconnections, whether they're end fit or not. This res will result in, in further compatibility issues from one hospital to another. Um, Neil indicates he's been in the midst of this for years, and it seems as if we're making progress as a snail at a snail's pace. I think it's important for the consumers as well as the caregivers and the healthcare professionals to push for this, and hospitals need to see it as a priority. Um, I just want to look at the time here. Okay, um, now Anne goes on to say in comment to some of, of Dr. Man, Manpreet's or Mundi's data, um, you say no big difference except for the 14 French, um, but my daughter has a 14 French. It will be a big difference for people like us. And, and um, as the editor in chief for JPEN and a scientist, I, I appreciate so very much what you're saying. We, we take pools of data um, and of course the scientific method allows for this but we take you know as much data as we can gather do stats on it and say it's not different but for any one individual consumer or caregiver it that's very different right um, and and so you know one individual is is not the average um, as as it is represented sometimes in the, the studies that are published. And so I, I think your point needs to be heard from all of us because for you and your daughter, uh, it, it's a very big difference. Um, it's completely different. And so that's why um, we want to come back and hear from other stakeholders. We're at a time right well, now. Could I, yes. I interrupt, it's Lisa. I yes. just wanted to say that um, I think that Dr. Mundy's point with that 14 French was that they were saying there weren't any significant difference except for the problem with this 14 French. And I believe it led to some changes to the 14 French that were that made the flow rates better. So it's something yes. important that we should probably ask Dr. Mundi about when he when he's able to join us. Absolutely. I I, I hope that I wasn't perceived as discrediting his data. That mm -hmm. is exactly what he said. Um, and that depending on the blender and the, the recipe, the time um, that those things were more important than, than the actual tube, right? Though the 14 French was a bit distinct. But the point I'm trying to make is we look at these data across 
a number of, of patients and situations and we make these, we draw conclusions based on means and variation and an individual patient though is, is not dealing with that variation. They're dealing with their own specific situation uh, and unique needs. And when we come back from our break, we are going to be talking about all of those individual needs uh, that so many of you have, but we'll be having a panel that will, will address uh, some, of, some of the issues that, that exist regarding. regarding. And I have Dr. Monday has entered the building. Uh, Dr. <laughs> Monday, welcome. Uh, we've just finished your lecture. Thank you so much for, for, for providing us with that information and also for your time in conducting this work. Uh, you are certainly the leading expert on this um, and have generated, generated these, these important data uh, that, that help guide, guide the decisions and what, what kind of advice that we can provide. So I'm, I'm grateful for you for taking the time to, to become an expert in this area. It is time for our break, Joan. Shall we let Dr. Mundi keep, catch his breath and we'll carry on then? <laughs> Oh yeah, he looks exhausted. <laughs> Let's send him on a break. Okay. okay. So, we will take a 10 minute break. Please do return in 10 minutes uh, at 1.55. I'm looking at the chat. Yes. 1.55 Eastern time. Uh, so do that calculation depending on where you are. We're going to be talking some more about the deadlines. Um, we will hear from Lisa, who will lead a panel of consumers and clinicians who will introduce themselves and share some of their thoughts on, um, on NFIT and issues that, that we need to be aware of uh, and considering as we look at innovating and making this a solution that works for, for all OLE members. Perfect. Thank you very much. And, and Dr. Mundi, if you'd like to take a look at the the chat feature and some of the see some of the questions that came in. That would be good. Perfect. All right. Thanks. We'll see you in 10 minutes. Welcome back. Uh, I hope all of you enjoyed your 10 minute break and are ready to get started um, with with a little bit more of an interactive part of our afternoon. Uh, I want to welcome Dr. Mundi. Uh, we, we just heard your lecture, Dr. Mundi. Thank you very much for sharing your expertise on this. Uh, in the chat, we've had a number of, of questions. Some we've addressed, others uh, I think we, we definitely will over the course of the, the remaining time. There was an issue that came up though um, that I, I want to ask you about a disclosure and um, funding from Nestle, how that might have impacted uh, the, the study that you've ha you had and, and the data that you shared. It's such a valid point, and I'm so glad to see that people are actually looking at disclosures, right? Because no matter what we do, it, these things tend to bias in some way. Um, and so, you know, in terms of the research that we did, it was purely on voluntary basis. And at that time, I had no funding from Nestle whatsoever. Um, and, and we wanted to make sure that it was done on a volunteer basis. So it was essentially done by Mayo Clinic and the FDA. And the only thing that we received from industry were the tubes. They submitted their um, finished you know, uh, tubes that were ready to go on market, as well as formula. Uh, so those were the two things, and Oli helped us get some of the formula to be tested. At that time, I didn't have any funding uh, with Nestle, but subsequently, uh, we've gotten some grants to do work on peptide-based diets, um, looking at really what should be the next step if patients aren't tolerating enteral nutrition, like the standard formula as well. Uh, and so those are unrestricted research grants where we kind of control the trial and, and carry it out um, and then publish the results. So I, I can fully say that for the work that was done, uh, there weren't any grants and I still haven't received any grants that would kind of overlap with the tubes uh, at all. And I, I haven't consulted with any of the companies either just to stay completely neutral. 
Thank you. I, I, I agree with you as a scientist. I think it's so important that we include our disclosures uh, and also, also not just financial ones that, was, that relates to partnerships we may have with industry, but um, you know, just our scientific history, right? I um, often joke that my biggest disclosure should be my favorite nutrient is butyrate. Uh, and that might influence me more than, than um, you know, perhaps receiving $500 or something for giving a talk somewhere. <laughs> there, there is a, a question here. Um, will NFIT connectors allow me to continue using 22 French G2 through which I use home blended food? I do not use formula unless I'm on a trip or not home from, from my meal. So what kind of flexibility might there be for individuals you know, who, who manage it like this? Yeah, and, and I think based on our research, the, ans the short answer would be yes. Um, what we found is that as opposed to the conversion from legacy to NFIT, other factors played a bigger role. So as an example, if you syringe feed, the FDA really showed that just going a bit slower negated any extra force that was needed. And some of their testing and fit tubes actually required less force in many cases, um, especially in that range of the, the, the 14 to 20, 22 French. Um, they also, we also found that, you know, the, the formula could be thinned a little bit for viscosity sake, and that also improved things. Uh, we did work on blenders. And the blender that was used mattered. And here, what we did was we tested like an Osler $50 blender, something in the $100 range, $200. And then the Vitamix, which I always say could blend a shoe, you know, to a consistency that you want. And what we found actually, I'm not saying you should go out and get a Vitamix because if you blended longer with the $50 blender, it, it did the same thing. And so blend time also played a role more so than, than the, um, the legacy versus infant. So based on those, I mean, we felt confident in many of our patients. I mean, we've gone through the transition in 2018 and they're using blenderized tube feeding and, and we have not gotten any negative feedback. Thank you. Uh, if there are any other questions for Dr. Amundi, please feel free to, to get them into the chat. I will try and make sure that we pose them. Um, Dr. Amundi, do you have any comments on low profile tubes? Yeah, um, same thing. Again, uh, we, we have transitioned those as well and are doing well. We, we even looking at it uh, initially, we felt that really where the issues were going to arise were actually the high, you know, the 24, 26 French tubes that had a large, larger bore. Um, and that's what the data showed. Aside from that one tube, which didn't make it to the market, that was the 14 French NFIT tube. Um, but aside from that, that's where the issues have been. With the other sizes, including the low profile, you know, it's such an equivalence of going from the legacy to NFIT that again, we have not run into uh, issues with providing feeds or, you know, blenderized tube feeding. So you know that there have been many, many um, individuals who, and, and a movement towards using blenderized diets and, and being able to give kids, you know, that real food uh, through their tube. How would you summarize the implications of that with this NFIT change? Yeah, um, I, I think exactly. It's the, the variability is what led us to do a lot of the testing and make sure. Uh, but when we were done with the testing, I mean, we really felt confident that this can meet the vast majority of needs. Uh, and then you look at the the topic of misconnections and how we need to have that really drive down to as close to zero as possible just because of the dire consequences. So the benefit of all small bore tubes, again, not just enteral, right? That's the first of many, that's the key point that we're gonna have IVs that look different. Foley catheters are gonna go through this, you know, tra respiratory, right? Traits, uh, and, and I mentioned the neuraxial they're already starting to make that transition. 
So once we transition all of those, I think we're gonna have a much safer environment for patients that really prevents all of these misconnections for going on. So to me, because of that benefit, it drives us to push in this direction. Um, so that's what we've done. Neil Ede uh, asked a comment. There have been concerns raised regarding the NFIT connectors on the extension sets of the low profile devices, as well as the high profile tube with an NFIT connector when used for gastric decompression, uh, that they are not providing adequate gastric decompression. And I'm gonna use this to transition into our panel discussing that, but should these be changed out for larger French size in your opinion? Because this might be an issue for our pediatric patients. We, we can, exactly. And this is where we are, you know, the venting, the decompression, those are the issues that we're really still working on and what's the best solution. Uh, for many of our patients, we have what we think we found a solution, and I, I um, uh, went and picked up from our closet kind of the venting bag that we've been using that's been working well in many cases. But uh, I think if the predominant need is for venting and not really feeding, that's when we have to then think about exactly one of the options is do we go with a larger bore solution um, or do we work with industry and then create a non-entral venting solution that's then used in how we could transition patients back and forth? So that is something that I think more, more to come, and I'm sure the panel will shed some light. Uh, but exactly, if, if you're struggling and you have a lower bore, lower profile kind of tube and main need is venting, that's when you should talk to your healthcare provider and, and we can look for other solutions. I think it's really important uh, when, when you say we, because um, you were here when I shared some, some of the, the questionnaire data showing that so many healthcare providers, you know, there, there's a good number that haven't even heard of, of these tubes yet. And so we're going to really have to do a lot of education in order to make, meet patient, patients' needs. So this is a good, a good, um, point to pivot to the panel, but let me ask one more thing on behalf of David Rowland. Um, you said the balloon ports accept a lure syringe, uh, and that's dangerous. So will balloon ports be changed to NFIT? Um, so, the, yeah, that's a great question. I don't, I don't know if the balloon ports will. Um, I think the IV will change. I do know that. So because of that, I'm thinking, that the balloon ports will have to not change the NFIT, but change to the IV, right? Yeah. Because typically we're using them for saline. Um, again, this is just me thinking off the top of my head, but that's the direction I would see when that IV ISO, does, I think is dash nine, when that goes into place, the balloons may have to transition to that. Okay, thank you. Uh, I have see some more comments that have come in. I'm gonna ask that those be held so we can go to our panel and uh, we will address these then either as part of that or after. Lisa, can I turn this over to you? Thanks, Kelly. This is a good segue into, um, <clears throat> sorry, the camera. This is a good segue into the panel. Mary, we're so glad you joined us. <laughs> And actually some of the, one of the comments I think will be pertinent to our discussion, but um, let's get into it. We have several consumers and caregivers, uh, sorry, clinicians joining us and we decided we would do it as a panel. So we'll all be on the screen together. <clears throat> We've got Luke Vosing, I think he's on the call. Um, Hadar and Beth Lyman. Neil E. Neil, you'll be able to ask your question again. Uh, Lori Rayan and Cynthia Reddick. So if we can, Donna, if you can let them share their cameras, we can have them on the screen with us. That would be great. But I wanted to start with Luke. So um, Luke has to leave for an appointment. Um, so I wanted to give him a chance to sure. share his story. Thanks, Luke. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so first, I'll just give you a little bit um, about myself, and then we'll just talk a little bit about uh, NFIT and how uh, our institution and myself actually went through that. So 
Again, my name is Luke Bosing. I am a nurse uh, by trade. I've been a nurse for about 11 years or so. I'm, I'm also um, a feeding tube user. Um, I've had a G-tube uh, most of my life um, since I was about nine years old or so. Um, and I currently work at Nationwide Children's Hospital in Columbus, Ohio. And I actually uh, work on their simulation program, um, which is where we train doctors and, and nurses how to do different things. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about uh, Nationwide and kind of how we transitioned um, and some of the issues and, and things that came up uh, during that transition. So Nationwide transitioned 100% uh, end fit um, about a year or so ago. Um, so we've gotten away from our old legacy tubes. Um, and again, we're, we're currently using all end fit uh, with our inpatients as well as our home care um, recipients. So those, those who utilize our home care. This was a, um, a gradual rollout that we did uh, with the hospital. So we first performed a lot of education, again, with our doctors and nurses about ENFIT, what it was, why we were transitioning, um, and you know, really safety being the number one reason. Once we made that um, transition, uh, we then had the products essentially that were stocked within the hospital again, switched uh, essentially overnight. So those nurses came in uh, the next day and then all of their enteral supplies, including syringes and those sorts of things uh, had been transitioned over to NFIT tubes. There, it was received uh, pretty well by our nurses because again, they didn't have to deal with any uh, accidental disconnects, uh, flooding the beds uh, with feedings um, and those sorts of things. So our nurses really uh, like the NFIT transition. I will say, I, I think the biggest issue that we had uh, and that we still kind of uh, experience on a daily basis is if you were to get any feeding actually within the NFIT connection because they screw together, sometimes those feedings can actually dry and it makes it really hard to get that NFIT connection to disconnect uh, when you have to switch over your feedings to a new bag or new tube. Um, but that's, that's really been the largest uh, issue that we've seen as far as transition goes uh, up to this point. So that's the biggest complaint we've received from nurses. I guess looking forward to the future, um, we are a little bit concerned uh, with this transition really over uh, syringes, uh, our, our main concern. Um, our home care company has really decided not to provide those syringes. So currently the only place that our patients can actually receive those syringes are within the actual hospital itself or within their uh, pharmacies when they get uh, prescribed different NFIT medications, those sorts of things, they can get it from pharmacies as well. Um, so knowing this and what we've done is really anytime someone gets a prescription refilled, especially at our nationwide children's uh, pharmacy, we give them, um, for lack of a better term, a boatload of syringes. So we'll give them essentially handfuls of syringes to kind of uh, hopefully help make up for that. Um, my personal biggest concern is if you have someone who lives in, uh, let's say, a more rural area uh, who may not be well informed about this NFIT transition, if they were to run out of syringes and go to their local pharmacy seeking more, um, would they be able to get those? How would that local pharmacy know about this transition or change? And how do they obtain uh, NFIT syringes as well? Um, so that's, that's really been our biggest concern moving forward, especially once everybody transitions over to NFIT, as to uh, how that's going to occur, how that's going to happen. Thanks, Luke. Are, are you talking about all sizes syringes or medication syringes specifically? Really all size syringes. Um, so again, whenever we get a prescription for those, we will hand them essentially all size syringes. Um, but again, it's just having that NFIT transition connector on the end of that syringe. And, and how does a pharmacy, uh, again, I'm in Ohio, so how does a rural Ohio pharmacy, A, know about the NFIT transition coming up and then B, be able to obtain those syringes uh, so they, they can distribute it to members of the community. And then can I also ask a question? You mentioned that your your kind of home provider, do you have options? Like could the patients choose other providers or is the hospital really 
work with the one, um, I guess, DME provider? Sure. No, they have the option to choose really any DME provider uh, that they would like. So they're not essentially stuck with one provider. It was just that the, the DME I use has decided that uh, they're not going to supply those syringes anymore, which was kind of mind boggling uh, to me. How are, how are you going to supply me with bags and uh, tubes and everything, but not supply me with the equipment that I need uh, to utilize those things? That, that I, doesn't make sense to me. One of the questions we got through, I don't, I don't know, I've got questions coming through so many different angles. I don't remember where it came, but one was, um, do DMEs make their own choices to switch and where do those choices come from? And um, Manpreet, do you have a thought on that? Or I think that the, the, there's so many levels that the changes have to make place at, you know, um, that it really complicates it. It's so, uh, yeah, that one, there's no way I could answer. It's just, there's so many, especially financial, right? There's so many aspects to that. Um, we, we struggled with it quite a bit. And what we did was we just, you know, had an open communication with the companies we use. And we use multiple uh, just, just for this reason. Um, and then we made sure that they were aware that we're making this transition they knew typically like our volume of central patients. And so we kept them in the loop as to the exact date of the transition. Uh, so, and we were lucky that they were, you know, willing to get all of the supplies ready for that transition. So for us, it went fairly smoothly. Um, some of the main worries we had when we were making the transition were the supply constraints. Um, you know, obviously at that time, not as many folks were making the transition. And then, so supplies were a little bit harder, but we just made sure, you know, talking to the manufacturers, et cetera, that we had everything lined up to make that transition as smooth as possible for our patients. Sometimes the insurance uh, drives who you can work with in terms of a DME company, and you may want to make a change but are forced to stay with a company that's not wanting to play ball, if you will, uh, simply because they don't have a contract. That's, we've had that same problem here. Although in our institution, we have not made any progress towards this transition. It's very frustrating. We started working on it three years ago and uh, uh, it fell flat on its face uh, about within about two years of us working on it. And then uh, every time our director of quality goes to uh, administration to talk about it, it pretty much falls on deaf ears. That's why uh, that was the reason for my comment is uh, many institutions, including my own, are up for a rude awakening uh, when these uh, alternatives disappear from the shelves. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, that's what it's going to take. And unfortunately, sometimes we're a bit short sighted in our decision making. Cynthia, do you want to offer anything from the home care company perspective and, and introduce yourself? Sure. My name is Cynthia Reddick. I'm the National Tube Feeding Manager with Quorum CVS Specialty Infusion. So my, and part of what I'll talk about a little bit later is we have not had supply issues. We started dispensing NFIT devices over four years ago. So we've been slowly ramping up over the years. And what we've done and what was magnified over the last year unrelated to syringes is that having a variety of manufacturers as options in home care is key to success. So that's something that we've been able to, to do. Uh, we work with a variety of manufacturers and have options. And that would be my recommendation to any DME or home infusion company that um, you know wanted to support this. And I honestly can't exactly comprehend somebody refusing to add them to their inventory list. It doesn't make sense to me. We've even had trouble getting, uh, since the new standard for determining correct placement of feeding tubes is a gastric pH, we've even had trouble with people's willingness to provide uh, our uh, patients with uh, pH devices for assessing pe litmus paper even. We send the patient home with these uh, supplies. Mm -hmm. you know, could you take a second? Yeah, Sorry, Sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. 
I was going to say that's another, it's not NFIT related, but you know, there was a time when we offered um, stethoscopes and that didn't exactly make sense. So we switched over to um, solely dispensing the, the pH strips. So that's more the standard of practice in home care for, for training the parents and, and other caregivers. Neil, I was just going to suggest that you introduce yourself for a minute. Oh, well, I'm sorry. My name is Neil Eid. Um, I'm uh, a nurse practitioner working for the Department of Pediatric Surgery. So we place all the enteral feeding devices in our pediatric patients. I work in pediatrics. I'm also the uh, current chair of the nursing section at Aspen. And at every monthly conference call, we bring up this topic, uh, up, have a, an update from various institutions where they're going through the transition. Uh, and some of our section members have actually developed podcasts and webinars where they help institutions go through um, the process. Uh, uh, actually, they did a webinar in conjunction with GEDSA uh, that uh, 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 was geared at educating other institutions and caregivers as uh, troubleshooting the process of implementation. So uh, we're, it's part of our work plan uh, for the nursing section, and we're very, very invested in this. Thanks, everyone. Um, and thanks, Luke, for bringing up those points. I'm going to move to Hedar. Um, and is Beth on the line, Hedar, do you know? Yes. Great. Okay, so Hadar, I'll let you introduce yourself and um, maybe Beth could take a second and introduce herself before you get into your story and you can explain why we're asking you both to kind of co-present. Hadar, I, am, I have a G-tube and a J-tube. Uh, I'm also a 24 seven um, TP, uh, TPN user. I use my G-tube as a, for drainage and venting uh, 24 hours with a bag um, and the J-tube for uh, medication. Uh, my G-tube is legacy and my J-tube is with in, infit. Uh, go ahead, Beth. My name is Beth Lyman. I am a retired pediatric nutrition support nurse. Hello, everyone. Um, see a lot of faces um, that I recognize. <laughs> anyway, um, I now work as a consultant uh, part-time, hopefully part-time. Um, but anyway, I work with Hadar and her home TPN needs and her G-tube needs. And she and I um, have connected on many levels. And when she got switched from a uh, legacy gastrostomy tube to an NFIT gastrostomy tube, that was another layer of connection that Hadar and I had. So I'll had to leave it to you, Hadar, to talk about that. Um, so I went to um, the institute, one of the institutions, the local institution over here uh, in the area that I live in. And uh, I live just outside Philadelphia and I went to one of the hostels um, to get my tubes changed and I do it under sedation because it separates G and J. I wake up and I find out that instead of legacy, now I wake up with two NFIT um, in both the G and the J uh, for the first time. And I go home with NFIT and I very quickly find out that I'm not able anymore to eat or drink or do anything um, that, that give me any kind of sense of human, being human, actually. Um, if before it, I was able to enjoy drinking a cup of coffee and dip a tea biscuit or eat a jello or eat, eat um, some ice cream or something like this and let it drain through uh, the G-tube without it causing me um, extreme nausea and start vomiting and so on. Now I wasn't in a place where um, the infant wasn't allowing it anymore to go through. And I was in a place where I was immediately in pain and discomfort. And um, 
I was nothing was going through no matter what I was trying to unclog it I had a, a bag a special bag the antique bag that was connected to it and nothing was going through, through it um, because the hall you go from the legacy hall which is much wider and much uh, much larger to a, basically a pinhole um, and no food and um, no thickness of food and no air actually is can go through it um, and just I was in a lot of discomfort and thanks to um, Beth actually she helped me um, we went to the um, hospital it's done it um, we spoke with them we explained the situation um, they were willing to change uh, the ruling um, and their um, um, the regulation just for the patient that go that have a drainage slash venting tubes and let them have legacy tubes because they understood that the amount of pain and discomfort that the patient go through um, is uh, just not reasonable to ha have a patient go. Um, you know, it, it's not practical to have a patient have an NFIT for this. I NFIT, I like the NFIT a lot as a J-tube. It's worked for me as a J-tube. I appreciate it as a J-tube. I like the safety of it as a J-tube. But as a G-tube, it does not work for me. I am connected 24-7 to a bag. And I really don't see the reason why, you know, it needs to be changed. So... That's my point of view. Uh, Beth, go ahead. You're on mute. Beth, you're muted. All right. Sorry, I didn't want to interrupt you. Um, I would just say that what Hadar went through, uh, what we went through together was an, uh, a an opportunity for clinicians to advocate for consumers, for patients. And that's what I did. I went to the people I knew at the facility where she works, where she receives her health care, and um, essentially told them that what she was saying was absolutely true. And I'd seen it in other patients and that the uh, use of a G-tube, an infant G-tube for an adult um, for decompression is really ineffective and there have to be other answers uh, for them. So I am a strong proponent of NFIT as well. I co-chair the clinical advisory board. Um, and so I, I would love to have NFIT be the one size fits all answer, but it is not. And uh, for a significant subset of people that need a G-tube to drain mucus, fluid, and the occasional sip of tea and graham cracker or whatever, um, it has to be a legacy too. So that's that's my stance on that. Actually, I have a I spoke to Ohio State University yesterday about this very topic, and they did tell me that I could quote them on this, but they're struggling with the very same thing. And their stance is that use of NFIT tubes for um, decompression for, for drainage um, is non-negotiable. <laughs> it doesn't work. So I have now quoted them and they should be happy if they're on this call. Uh, we had a, a, a discussion about that on the um, public policy committee uh, for Aspen because one of the surgeons is on that committee when we talked about and she brought that to the public policy committee just as one of her patients had an untoward reaction when they were using their tube for gastric decompression. So she was very adamant about uh, this whole issue. And so um, I, I agree with Beth, it's not a great solution. We have a patient right now, inpatient who has a J and a G like Hadar and the J tube is being used for what? The J tube is being used for feeds, and that's going well. What? But the, yeah. Or, I'm sorry. Um, somebody is unmuted, I guess. At any rate, uh, we cannot get adequate decompression from the, get the gastric tube 
uh, and the child has persistent vomiting and he's not even being fed through the um, uh, gastric port or by mouth. So uh, we uh, struggle with that same issue. Lori, I know that you're on the, the calendar, the schedule a little bit later, but it seems like a good time to jump in. And then I have somebody on the line too, Mary Smithers, who's going to um, join us for just a minute to explain her situation too. You unmute Mary, Lori. <laughs> oh, Don probably needs to unmute her. Here, I think I'm unmuted now, hi. My name is Lori Ray and I'm the clinical nurse specialist for parenteral and intranutrition nutrition for the UCLA health system. We underwent our NFIT conversion in November of 2020. Fortunately, we got it done right before our winter COVID wave hit. Um, we are a 950 bed health system that encompasses three hospitals, um, a children's hospital within a hospital and a variety of core tertiary care services plus a large ambulatory network. We had had NFIT conversion on our to-do list for many years before we actually did it. And many of our um, attempts to do it really fa failed and because I think I cannot overstate what a huge undertaking it was. And it wasn't until we got a dedicated project team together um, with a project, a dedicated project manager who's really spent over 50% of their work time for over a year to get this um, project done. I, I would just like to comment when we look at the difference between the United States and uh, the European Union and Australia and other countries, I think it really over the year as we were going through the process, I really came to realize this is a reflection of how we deliver healthcare in the United States. The countries that have been able to do this successfully have a more centralized oversight of healthcare. So I think that makes implementation very much easier. Um, I think the reason you, you know, see hospitals that struggle with it is because it's a huge undertaking. Um, in our um, walkthroughs, in just in trying to identify the scope of the project, we identified over 200, you know, close to 200 unique items that needed to be conversion and multiple, multiple departments that needed to be on board. So between dealing with our supply chain issues, our education of providers um, and caregivers, and then the transition of care, I cannot, again, overstate how big an undertaking it is. Um, we are kind of settled into it, but we still have, I, I would say, um, uh, three to four huge issues. And I think the gastric decompression issue that others have so eloquently um, discussed is one that's huge, not only from the standpoint that there are patients where the legacy tube is the only really suitable way to get them decompressed, but even in cases where you can do with an infant tube in some of our, you know, infants and smaller children where they're, they're you know, you can use the infant. We now no longer have a suitable and fit compatible enteral drainage system. We were very excited when we implemented this to have the halyard enteral um, drainage system because, you know, typically um, our enteral drainage systems are very MacGyvered together. Um, but halyard, as of May of this year, we got the, we got the, you know, notice in March that Halyard is not going to be manufacturing this any longer. And I am really not aware. I just went to look for somebody mentioned Cardinal was making an alternative. Uh, if it exists, it's not very evident in, in the Google universe. Um, so I think we're left again with, uh, you know, some very unsatisfactory options for this kind of drainage. Um, I think medication administration is something we still struggle with, and especially for low dose uh, medication administration for our infants and neonates, where um, I think there is still literature out there, and I'm, I'm you know, 
looking at the literature that came out of Shands and University of Florida as recently as last year, um, pointing to the you know pretty significant prevalence of dosing inaccuracy um, in the low dose range. So uh, for that reason, we uh, and because the complexity of the workflow flow to produce oral and enteral syringes out of one single pharmacy, we are still currently administering with adapters um, in our pediatric population. Um, I think the other thing with medication administration, and I think um, it was mentioned about, you know, the, the availability of the NFIT syringes from pharmacies, not widely available for med dispension. And then the availability of the adapters that are needed to draw up medications accurately. There is, and my vendors, and I work with multiple vendors throughout the United, Western United States, there's no reimbursement. So as there's no incentive to provide them for patients and family members. Um, I think uh, the other issue we struggle with in our uh, critical care areas, um, is that, and I, and you know, don't jump on me. I know it's not right, but very often the sump is the initial feeding access in our adult critical care areas. And it is a bridge, you know, it may be a two or three day bridge to getting a more appropriate enteral accesses, but the reality is it is still used. So finding the appropriate adapter to, um, you know, use that device as a bridge is very challenging. We, we recognize there are NFIT compatible sumps on the market, but that leads to um, the need for adapters for the suction component of the thing. And our surgical colleagues really feel like the less, you know, bits and pieces you have in circuit, the more effective your suction is going to be. So um, that is a little bit of an unsatisfactory issue from our um, standpoint. Um, I would I would say the other thing is some of our community partners, for example, our school partners, our school nurse part, um, school system partners, are not as familiar with um, things like the the need to you know push blenderized tube feeds through the enteral tubes, and their protocols actually haven't even caught up to the fact to allow. Um, school nursing or assisted personnel to push feeds. So we've had families that have had to go to pumps um, when, you know, so I think there's some catching up to do. Um, you know, I think our institution is, even though we've, we've done it, we've gotten, you know, it up and running and we're pretty settled in with it. We still, um, the challenges we face are very reflective of the challenges that are being discussed here on this panel. So I look forward to some more discussion and feedback. Thanks, Lori. Appreciate that. Um, Mary Smithers, are you on the line that you could talk for a minute? Yes. Great. Yes, I'm here. I, I find the NFIT connection to be very unsatisfactory when um, somebody gave me a message. Oh, here I am. Um, very unsatisfactory when it comes to to venting the the um, gastric. I I have tried it. I bought the bags and if everything was um, if everything was j just the um, gastric components it would um, Uh, I can't think. If there's the tiniest little bit of, of a piece of solid, say a, 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 from a berry 
little berry seed. Uh, it will get stuck in it and it will not go through. So anything with any thickness at all will, will go through in, in my case. But when I had gastritis and there was other objects of thickness, I, um, I, I, I couldn't use them anymore. I, I had to go back to using the same setup that I had used for years, and that was a Foley bag with a uh, piece of plastic tubing attached to it, and a and a um, adapter to let it drain. Um, I I was be totally behind Halyard making the gastric drainage bag. And the bag is wonderful. It's it's a wonderful size, but because it's got the in-fit adapter end on it, it it doesn't work. So that is an issue for me. It's an issue for Hadar. It's an issue for for any of us that have to use it to drain our 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 stomachs Hadar, I'm, I'm with you no matter just a little bit of anything that gets stuck in that tiny hole and it causes a backup and then you have to go through trying to to clear it and you really need to have a, a a syringe with the other end on it. I have one syringe that, but it it doesn't fit the end that needs to be drained. <laughs> so, yes, I've had I've had issues with it. I've tried. I was very much. I'm very much behind infant and and changing the the access i know that some mistakes have been made that have been horrible but for those of us that need to change in um They need to go back to having a the old end on the gastric portion, so that those of us that need it can can continue to vent. Thanks, Mary. I appreciate that. Um, I do. There is a um, some good news, possibly good news, in the chat from Mike Kuzak, who is the um, with Getsa says that several GEDS members have submitted or are submitting to the FDA venting decompression devices that will be NFIT compatible. Um, he says, and Mary, I think Lori said she looked this up and didn't find anything, but she says, he said, um, in fact, I believe that Cardinal now has a new NFIT compatible venting device on the market. So something to look for um, and maybe to watch for some new solutions. Um, Hedar, did you want to add something? Yes, I think that um, I, um, to add to Mary, um, part of the problem I see with NFIT, um, though I like it for medication, um, because I have separate G and J, I can't tolerate a lot of um, volume in my J. I can tolerate only a few mLs at a time, no, usually no more than five to max of 10 ml at a time. So I take my medication not in liquids. I uh, usually take 
pills and I crush them. And that's the way that I ask all of my medications to be in a pill form or capsule form and um, everything but liquid. And what I find with the infant is that, uh, as Mary mentioned it, that every, if even the little bit, uh, if you have the tiniest piece, piece that is not crushed all the way, um, that will block the entire um, system. So um, this is something that is really we have to work with because we still want to deliver medication. And even it's, you know, we still need to figure out that some patient can't always have liquid medication, doesn't always work for us liquid medications. Um, you have to find a way to maybe make the uh, pinhole, as, as, as they call it, just maybe wider, just to make it a bit, you know, let it a bit more space. So let, let more in. Um, and from my own point of view, of course. The, um, so Mike Kuzakis, and we can give him a minute, he's with Getz again. He said, we're talking about apples and oranges here, which is good to know. The ISO standard only applies to devices used to deliver nutrition or supplements. Industry will need to supply devices dedicated to venting decompression. So it may be a completely different project product. Um, it's not necessarily going to be a feeding tube anymore. Um, I think you're right. I, I, I was around when the first low profile device was around, the old barred button. And the barred button had three different tubings. It had a tubing for a, a continuous feed, for bolus feeds, and for decompression. Since then, essentially all the tubes that have been developed are really designed for feeding. They're not really, if you're using them for decompression, it's essentially off-label use. So I think he brings up an excellent point that if you're talking about decompression of the stomach, you're going to need a decompression tube and not a feeding tube. And uh, maybe that's the answer to this dilemma, is that industry needs to come up with something like that. Uh, I, I don't know what if there's an impetus for them to do that, but I think you're absolutely right. I think he was absolutely right in his comment. That's why we're doing this, really. That's why we've gotten everybody together. We have manufacturers in the, um, they're quiet, but they're there, and FDA is on the line, um, just listening and learning and and, why maybe it seems like Mary and Hedar have the same story, Lori and Neil have similar stories, but they're stories that need to be out there and, and heard so that um, so that the issues are are out there. Um, Manpreet, did you want to add anything? I've got you're you're there and we have one more. Um, Cynthia Reddick will go after you and then we'll no, I mean, I think I'm listening as well. And I think especially with, especially in the chat, you know, this is kind of one of the most common remaining big, you know, aspects of NFID that I think we have to tackle. Um, the ISO standard is dictating a lot of the design. Um, and I just, I don't know what's feasible in terms of going back and redesigning that ISO standard, because as I kind of mentioned, NFIT just happens to be the first one to go ahead. And it's like, as part of that ISO 80369, it's the dash three. Um, there is a respiratory, there's a neuraxal, there's a Foley, there's an IV, all those standards are being established and finalized. So I, I think that's what's dictating. But again, as Mike was bringing up, all that pertains to enteral feeding. And so it seems like, you know, the logical step would be to have a set of tubes or we would love to even see the end adapters, you know, be, this is an enteral end adapter, just like everyone is saying. And then this is for decompression and, and venting. Uh, I think if we're able to kind of engineer our way out of this, um, that would then allow for the transition, because that seems to be the apprehension that may be holding off a lot of folks. Uh, so, you know. So what you're suggesting would also help with like a GJ, but if somebody has a, a, a tube that they use for both venting and feeding, would they have to have two separate stomas, two separate 
uh, I was talking about the end component right. of it, right? Um, mm -hmm. You know, uh, that the kit could come with different ends and then uh, it could even be, you know, I don't know if that's possible with a balloon, we may have to think of other solutions, but some sort of solution where uh, really going in, um, just like the, Hadar, you brought up your situation, you know, we have that discussion uh, with the consumer patient that this is going to be the predominant use for this tube. Um, and so therefore, this should be the end adapter. And if it's for decompression, like you happen to have two tubes, then the end adapter for that decompression, you know, doesn't need to be end fit because it needs to be an end adapter for decompression. So I think that may be what we have to kind of work with industry and, and get guidance from the FDA on how we get these different sets of indications uh, for these tubes to meet these needs. Manpreet, what I, what I meant was um, with what Mike was suggesting, if there's a whole separate kind of tube for venting in, and I know we don't know everything about it by any means, but just looking at it with what we do know, would that mean two separate stomas? I mean, you couldn't do it. Well, maybe you could do a GJ kind of thing, I guess, right? <laughs> yeah, you, you, you could. And I think that's where we will have to innovate and look at the solutions. I mean, we don't absolutely want to put in extra stomas if we don't need to do that. So that that I don't, you know, think would be the direction we'd want to go, um, but instead to look at what can be done in terms of that end connector uh, that would allow us to then meet the needs for that particular tube, right? Like a GJ, in in many situations, the GJ the G is often used for decompression and the J for feeding, right? So perhaps the tube would come pre-designed in that situation where it would have a non-end fit larger bore for the gastric port and then the end fit for the jejunal port allowing us to feed. So some situation like that. Thanks, I appreciate that. I appreciate everybody who's contributed so far. Um, we're gonna kind of switch gears a little bit. Cynthia is, um, well, I'll let you introduce yourself. And I think you're gonna talk about kind of where things are in your experience? Yeah, I wanna, we're definitely gonna change gears a little bit. I wanna pull the lens back and sort of get big picture just from our home care perspective. I don't know if Dawn's able to pull up my slides. If not, I can pull them up because I wanted to walk through our experience. Thanks and thank you in advance for driving for me. So I'm Cynthia Reddick. Uh, like I said earlier, I'm the National Tube Feeding Manager at Quorum. I've been in home care since 1999. I've been with the organization for gosh 14 years now. So I've been sort of following along this journey and studying this population. I'm going to share a little bit of my studies with you. So let's go to the next slide and I'll tell you what I'm going to tell you. I figured we could begin by just talking, I'll talk about my home care perspective, Quorum's home care perspective, and then I thought I would dive into some data. So we'll look at, again, this is Quorum's lens. So remember that as you're looking at this data, it's our patient population. It's a population that I study as it relates specifically to NFIT. So I'll just kind of share our age ranges, break the breakdown of those age ranges. I'll share with you some trends that I've been tracking for the last several years. Like I said, we began dispensing NFIT tubes over four years ago, um, but I started the data collection several years ago. And then I thought it would be interesting to look at what's been happening over the past year as well and, and sort of what some of the adoption trends look like. Actually, I'm gonna go back over the last three years. So let's go to the next slide. All right, so here's, here's my perspective. There's a lot of information here. Let's start on the right in the red section. So this is uh, a look at our feeding style in our tube feeding population. So 35% are fed bolus, 58% are fed 
via pump and the rest are gravity fed with the gravity bag system. Uh, because I knew we would be talking about drainage, I thought I'd take a look at our population of patients that are actually using drainage bags for gastric decompression. There are patients that vent with just syringes and they're not using drainage bags. But this is our population of consumers who are using uh, on a regular basis drainage bags. Some of those are the NFIT drainage bags by Avenos, and most of them, however, are urinary bags that have historically been used, what we've had to use in, in the home care space. So uh, again, it's less than 5% of our population. Uh, we've had 600% growth in NFIT adoption, meaning NFIT patients that are using NFIT devices over the past um, several years. Um, however, we still remain at a low percentage of our total population. We're at about 14% right now. So what are my observations in this journey? I'll talk about supply shortages, portability of care, and then, and then share a little bit of the patient experience feedback that we've received, our clinicians have received. So I talked about this earlier, supply shortages have not been a, an issue for us in the NFIT category. Um, like I said earlier, we use a variety of manufacturers and so we're able to substitute and not have uh, really any significant disruption to our consumers. So as far as portability of care, this is, you know, the impact that NFIT makes on this concept, right? And patients being able to move from hospital to hospital, from city to city, from state to state, and then internationally, it, you know, what NFIT does for that population is it eliminates the need for these brand specific connections. It's something we struggled with since I've been in home care. It, when we have brand specific ports, we have to get that brand specific syringe and, and, that, can, and that can make things um, a little more difficult to connect or get adapters in order to connect to, to feeding bags. So that's been a challenge for us. And, and the, the beauty of NFIT in that regard is, is that it eliminates that. So patients can move anywhere in the world and, and connect uh, when they have an NFIT connection. For us in home care, it uh, simplifies supply management um, for the same reason I just mentioned. And it allows us to use a variety of vendors. So we can, when we have global shortages of things, that we, you know, we can easily move over to another manufacturer and have that sub out very easily for that, um, for that patient. As far as the patient experience, some of the positives are listed here. I'll also mention a couple of negatives. Um, I've been collecting feedback in preparation for this, but the reduced accidental disconnection and that feed the bed phenomenon that happens in the hospital setting, it also happens at home, or if something's disconnected, it's not um, inadvertently, it's not soiling clothes and that becomes a bit of a hassle. That syringe connection, the, the feeling of that is more secure and just, you know, the feedback uh, from a, a consumer I was talking to is that she just loves that she can trust the connection. So some, some of the drawbacks or challenges, uh, this goes for, this isn't specific to NFIT, but it was, this feedback was specific to NFIT is that the dexterity can be an issue. That's true for a lot of things as it relates to tube feeding. We have that same feedback for patients who have to bolus feed and can't manage pushing a plunger through a barrel of a syringe, um, but that is something that has come up. And then another issue is if we've got a patient who was not shepherded through the discharge process by one of our team members, and they didn't know that they had an NFIT syringe, and we didn't know that they had or an NFIT tube, and they didn't know that they had an NFIT tube, if they get shipped out a customary catheter tip syringe, then that doesn't quite connect. But um, that is something that has been an issue for us really all along the way when, when patients have been had like surgical drainage tubes sewn into their stomach and they have a lower lock connection and that didn't connect with a catheter tip uh, syringe either. So it's nothing new for us, but it's something that we have to manage all along the way. Okay, let's move on to the next slide and I'll dive into some of the, some of the data. All right, so this is the age, ra age range of our NFIT users, and this is effective Q1 of uh, 2021. This is the most recent data. The um, half of our population is under the age of 18. This is where the conversion started. 
for us um, four plus years ago was with the little pediatric NG tubes uh, in the children's hospitals or most of the hospitals that are converting first and we're seeing a bit of a shift in that. But um, our second largest category are patients that are over the age of 65 and then the 51 to 65 category and then the 18 to 50. If you were to um, merge them together, that would be our fourth largest group. Let's move on to the next slide. Okay, so this is where it gets kind of interesting. So I wanted to share what the trajectory has looked like, right? So the red bars are Q1 year over year. So Q1 2018, 2019, 2020, and 2021. And in the last, let's go back from 2018 to 2019, we had 129% increase in adoption. And then the following year was 122% increase in adoption. And then last year, which was our slowest year, which is, will not be a surprise to many people on this call because we didn't have quite as many hospitals or we didn't notice as many hospitals that we are working with uh, uh, do the NFIT conversion, but we still had a significant amount of conversion. So 57% growth in the last year. All right, and then next slide. I think it might be coming close to the end here. Okay, so this is really the, the last bit of information I want to share. So this is again, through a quorum lens. Um, if you look on the left, what you see are the top five states that have the most amount of hospitals that we are receiving patients from, meaning helping them transition home onto feeding. So when we receive a referral and we get a patient set up that's new to tube feeding, they're coming out of the hospital, we're working with variety of, varieties of hospitals. So what you're looking at on the left there are from largest to smallest, the amount, um, the states listed that have the largest quantity of hospitals in that state that are using NFIT. Then in the middle of the screen, under the gray column, you're looking at the top five states that have uh, the largest NFIT consumer census, meaning the, the largest quantity of patients in that state. And California should be no surprise that that's at the top of the list and they go down in descending order. So California for quorum has four times the amount of patients uh, using NFIT than the next largest state, which is Florida, then Illinois, Arizona, Minnesota. And then lastly, this is again, activity that shows you what's been happening over the last year. So these are the top 10 movers and shakers, so to speak. This is again, census or quantity of patients by state that had the biggest movement, the biggest growth in the last year. So these have been the busiest states in the last year uh, that have um, started to discharge more patients home uh, on tube feeding uh, with NFIT devices. And that I believe concludes really, really what I wanted to share with you and just wanted to sort of pull the lens back and show you what's been happening in home care from our perspective. Thanks, Cynthia, appreciate that. It's, um, we just did a survey to the Oli Foundation. We sent it out to all of our members and um, it's still open. So we'll make sure that the link is prominent on our website, but um, we've asked some of the same questions so it'll be interesting, just haven't had a chance to process all that information yet. Um, we've had a few questions come in. Does anybody have any questions for Cynthia specific to what she had? Well, and I, I don't know if anybody on the line, I think it would probably go back to. I would like to ask if you, you've got Florida high on your list, where in Florida have you found these? I don't know I anybody go back in Florida. To the data that... and look. Yeah, it's, it's on there for us. I'd have to go in and do a deeper dive to give you that answer. I don't have that information handy. Thank you. Maybe it's regional. Well, it's not uh, uh, University of Florida Shands Hospital is one of the largest hospitals in the state and they aren't using them i know and it's a 
It's a big, I, big state with a lot of hospitals that we work with. Again, this is this is corn, through a corn lens, so keep that in mind. Um, you know, that's my major disclaimer there. Manfrey, we have one question. I don't know if you can answer it or, or um, maybe I'll just put it out there as something that for um, the manufacturers on the line to listen to. This um, Michael Peck says both Arkansas Children's Hospitals have made both Arkansas Children's Hospitals have made the transition. We like the system and like the no mess bottle adapter for filling syringes. I am a nurse there and a parent of two toddlers with low profile G tubes and sun and central lines. I find the chat moves all over the place here on me. Um, many parents, including myself, do not like to have to use an extension to give some of the gun. You want me to jump in? I've got a pretty good shot at it. Yeah, I can't advance it without yeah. the next. Go ahead. Many, many parents, including myself, do not have to do not like to have to use extension sets to give medications. Many meds corrode the extension and Medicaid patients only get two per month in Arkansas. Um, is there plans to make a connector with the NFIT connector on one end and a low profile connector on the other end without a tube in the middle? I have a prototype example. If uh, we need an example of what she's asking or he's asking. Yeah, that would be hard for me to answer. I think we could, I don't know if uh, my Cusack or one of the manufacturers can tell us if there's something in the pipeline that would, you know, meet this need. I talked to Michael on the phone earlier today and he was explaining too that Medicaid only gives two extension sets. So if you use those extension sets for the administration of medication and they get gummed up, you're kind of stuck. So yeah. I don't know if anybody. I, I think this is where, you know, just a little bit about advocacy and, and Oli Foundation's role. And I think we've had some tremendous ambassadors as well go to Congress, but the whole, you know, coverage and, and of home enteral and parenteral really needs an entire overhaul. Um, right? Like stories like this, I mean, just to give them two extent, things like that, you know, these are on the order of magnitude of healthcare costs. These are on the minor end, yet we have these sort of limitations, you know, how many syringes someone can get, how many brushes they can get to clean. The, it just, I, I, I don't know. I, I don't know what else to say. It boggles the mind. And I think we have to keep advocating uh, for this. We have to keep showing and, and some of the prevalence work that we've done have shown that we have hundreds of thousands of folks out there on enteral nutrition at home and we all really have to fight for them and get the supplies they need. This is a perfect example, right? Of a whole venting solution that could come of this, a medication administration solution. So. There's a lot of work for us, uh, but I think if we work together and advocate, we'll hopefully get there. And if anybody wants to see Michael's uh, prototype, well, Michael, want to just show what you've got? Um, Don, can you let Michael share his? There you go. Wanted to. Um, it was the. Yep, there you are. You're muted, Michael. Michael, you're muted. Don, Michael's muted. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, he isn't muted. Okay. Oh, just no volume, Michael. He's not speaking. Well, we can get a picture. You can send me a picture of it and we can share it. Um, and anybody wants to see a picture of Michael's uh, suggestion, just email me. There it is. 
So he ex he explained it to me earlier that he's taken out the um, the tubing from the extension tube. So it's something specific for um, it, medication administration through a, a low profile device. You can purchase these slash themed extensions online. I'm not sure what you mean, Kimberly. I'm gonna, um, Cynthia, there was one question for you. Was if those statistics were for adults and peds, or it says, does that hospital chart include the entire hospital or just pediatrics? The the data that I shared was our entire population. So it's the first pie chart showed you what percentage of our NFIT users were pediatrics, so about half of them. Um, but the rest of the information was specific to all NFIT users, so all age ranges. Thanks. Um, and Kimberly says you can purchase med extensions online. So Kimberly, maybe you could email me that link and I can, we can share it in the newsletter um, if it seems. And also you can buy some NFIT, two NFIT syringes on Amazon and online, right, Mike? You can, that's true. And Lisa, I, um, you had asked me a question before and I couldn't get it back, I couldn't unmute myself fast enough. Would you repeat that question? I'll be happy to address it. Um, I would if I could. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I've been reading a lot of comments. <laughs> as you know, just as a general overview comment, overall comment, um, one of the difficulties our membership is having in the course of this transition, of course, is that we're maintaining collectively as a group two separate product lines, two separate production facilities. Um, you know, under FDA regulations, manufacturers have to validate and qualify production processes. And, and they, in, in order to do that, um, it's quite expensive to main two, maintain two parallel product lines, making basically the exact same product. And, and so consequently, bearing the cost of that from a manufacturing point of view is quite expensive. The repercussion is, of course, that um, R&D budgets are constrained because resources that could be going into the development of new products are actually being devoted to manufacturing uh, parallel lines, legacy products and NFIT products. So the bottom line message for us collectively is that the sooner we can complete, we the manufacturers can complete the transition to uh, NFIT, so all the hospitals are buying one product line, we can take those resources that we freed up by maintaining parallel production, inventory, et cetera, et cetera processes and devote those towards making new products for the marketplace. I think everyone would agree collectively, this is an underserved area in terms of new products and the manufacturers would love to spend resources that would generate new sales instead of maintaining two parallel product production lines. So just as an overview comment uh, and I'll, I'll stop there and take any other questions that might come along. Thanks, Mike, I appreciate that. Um, just in, in parallel to what Mike has said, and, and Mike's representing GEDSA manufacturers, which is, is a significant number of manufacturers, you can find all the list of GEDSA manufacturers um, or members, GEDSA members on the GEDSA site, which is stayconnected.org. Um, and we also have AMT. We did, I don't know if we still do, but we did have AMT joining us. Um, and if anyone from AMT would like to say anything about legacy tubes and their availability, um, please speak up. Um, I mentioned that because there have been comments about if draining and venting, if it's going to be a new product, um, it's got to come to market pretty quickly to be on the market before um, and if it starts to, before legacy starts to be phased out by many, many manufacturers. But Lisa, if, um, yes. Um, I've, uh, AMT is, is, she's unmuted now, Liz Von Driska. Hi everyone, um, my name is Liz Von Driska. I'm a marketing supervisor here at Applied Medical Technology. Uh, we as an organization, we will continue to offer a full NFIT product line and a full legacy product line pursuant of any FDA regulations or mandates that come out. We are dedicated 100% to patient safety 
and continuing to just provide them the tools they need for success, whether they are end fit material or whether they are legacy. So we will continue just to offer both at this time. Thanks, Liz. We, we felt it was important to um, represent what's going on in the full market. And also, um, as you can see, if you're following the chat, there's a lot of still a lot of pushback um, and a lot of um, resistance to NFIT, I think. Um, I do think NFIT's here. I mean, it's clearly here and, and not going anywhere. Um, a lot of hospitals have transitioned and a lot of people are using the system. I can't imagine it going away. Um, Dr. Mundy, do you have anything to say about that? You're very good at, at, <laughs> at addressing this. Yeah, I mean, no, I, I do. I mean, we've, we've transitioned and I, I loved seeing that Minnesota, despite, you know, being on the lower end of the population, um, was the you know, one of the five uh, in Quorum's uh, data set. Um, but yeah, I, I think, you know, we have to ensure patient safety. So that, that has to be our number one goal. Um, but clearly, as you're kind of seeing, and I think we'll have to have more of these forums just as we move along to make sure we're not missing any other gaps that, you know, we haven't addressed. I think as part of this, we discovered you know, how many patients were doing blenderized tube feeding and homemade blenderized tube feeding. And then since then, we've even seen you know, uh, companies like Nestle and Abbott and other real food blends, right? What we can go on, Kate Farms, come up with whole product lines that weren't there when we started. And I think Oli had a part in that and kind of raising some of that awareness. So that's my hope is that I know, you know, dealing with everyone, we've got some really brilliant people uh, and the solutions they come up with just are, are amazing. So I think we can innovate our way out of, out of this and make sure that it meets everyone's needs um, and is, is the safest solution. So I'm pretty positive. Uh, I just, you know, hope that everyone is able to kind of give us a chance and work along the system and, and we can get there. Thanks. Kelly, we welcome you to, I, I don't, does anybody else on the panel have anything else? I think I'm, I'm set. I don't know if we've addressed all the questions in the, in the chat. There were a lot, um, not trying to ignore any arguments against NFID. I just think that this, um, we're trying to focus on some new issues and see what we can do um, to help move things along for everyone. So if we're all set, I'm, I'm happy to turn things over to Kelly and Manpreet to kind of sum things up. Hi, right, Lisa, as I look at the chat, it appears that um, it's got a bit of a life of its own and many of those comments are being addressed by others too in addition to the panel. So I, I think that it's being well served. Um, Manpreet, let me um, let you provide some summaries or some, some need first and then, then I can finish off for us. Yeah, I think, uh, again, I, I just want to thank Oli for organizing this uh, once again and, and for giving me the chance to be a part of it. Um, every time, you know, I come to an Oli conference or a summit, I just learn so much. And, and I think today, for me, the, the takeaway, there, there still continues to be gaps, like I, I mentioned, and uh, venting is one where we do need an active solution. Um, so I think, you know, stepping back from this, we'll have to kind of work on that solution. Um, it seems like there's some innovation also in terms of medication administration, especially uh, around the pediatric uh, population. Um, there is also a big reluctance uh, to make the transition um, because of sort of that, what, what is involved. And our program went through this and, you know, really realized um, you know how big <laughs> of, of a take a task that was uh, to make this transition. Uh, we discovered just like the UCLA system did that we had hundreds and hundreds of, of devices out there uh, that were kind of you know everyone was used to using their own. 
Uh, so there were a lot of benefits in making that transition as well in that we were able to unify our entire group uh, in using a set of uh, tubes and that's helped quite a bit in terms of supply chain and also for us to then um, help patients when they're dismissed from the hospital because now we don't have to worry about 200 and some uh, connectors and devices. So I think there's been a lot of positives, but, you know, perhaps kind of keep working on the toolkit for hospitals who are reluctant uh, to make this transition. That, that may help as well, along with the innovation that's needed uh, in terms of venting solutions. So I, again, continue to be optimistic. I, I think we're, we're heading in the right direction. We just have to make sure that we can bring everyone uh, along with us. Ellie, can I interject something, even though I know I've said I'm done? <laughs> it occurred to me that one comment that seems like it might be something that, that can easily be addressed and maybe Oli can even have a role in it is um, one comment was that one of the hardest problems, I, I think it was a clinician, I think it was hospital-based, was identifying who has what. So if somebody comes in with NFIT or somebody comes in with legacy, you don't know until they're there and you don't know ahead of time what they might need. I don't, maybe we could give this some thought, you know, as a community and how we can help that at least for the time being, you know, whether it's a, a wallet card or, you know, some kind of a record or some kind of a uniform tag, you know. Your identification of yeah. like what system yeah. that, that yeah. individual is using. Yeah, that, that's interesting. And I think that that is something that, that Oli can play an important role in much, much as other groups wouldn't be able to. You know, when I look back on today, much like the NFIT forum six years ago, uh, I think this summit today has been critically important. We came together as a group of diverse consumers, caregivers, multidisciplinary providers, policymakers, industry, manufacturing partners, as I said, each with our own knowledge, perspective, and priorities. We knew that at the beginning of the day. And where I've heard not a single dissenting opinion is the need to eliminate, eliminate enteral tube misconnections. That need is absolute, right? So where we're at is facing adoption deadlines. We have so many stakeholders poorly prepared for the current timelines. So we need a 360 degree evaluation education, much like you just proposed, Lisa, and, and streamlining supply chains. But I, you know, I think where after this last portion is, is really we're also at these unmet needs as it relates to venting, draining, formula flexibility, rate gravity feeding issues, medication delivery, tube dislodgement, device ability, insurance reimbursement, like, and that's just an incomplete list of everything that was discussed today. Um, so, so thanks to all of you who have shared, listened, and learned just as we asked you to. You know, it seems clear to me that as we face these deadlines, we are nowhere done this conversation. Um, and I, I hope that Oli will be continued uh, to serve as a venue and a forum to continue that. Because remember, Oli's stance is on this issue is the importance of preventing misconnections while accommodating the needs of the entire Oli community. So in that regard, we have to continue to innovate and problem solve. Uh, and although I'm trying to think of this summary without the benefit of sleeping on it, which is always a good idea I've found, it strikes me that we need to look at distinct solutions for these distinct needs. Um, you know, Mike's apple and orange comment resonated with me. These enteral tubing misconnections have occurred because of the problem that with a little bit of effort, one tube fits all, right? It can fit the, the enteral feeding port, but it can also fit a central line. Uh, and, and in proposing a solution to that problem, we can't really expect that that solution, the distinct NFIT tube is gonna be designed, that is designed really for only enteral feeding can continue to meet the diverse functions that the legacy or that one tube fit all was, was doing. So, while it seems that we've made progress on the safety provided for enteral feeding administration with NFIT, and that was indeed the goal, it's clear to me that we find ourselves at a point where many consumers and caregivers have been inadvertently disenfranchised because their use of an enteral feeding tube has extended beyond the sole 
infusion of typical enteral formulas. So we have to catch up, right? We need to provide solutions for these other applications, many of which may be targeted to some other functions that the legacy teething, feeding tubes have been so valuable to for the broader group. It's that one fit tube, fit one tube fits all approach um, thus far as being dangerous. So we shouldn't expect that a tube designed not to fit all such as infant is gonna meet the needs of the diverse community. So we really have a lot of work to do to find alternate solutions for all of the alternate functions of legacy tubes. And um, in, in turning this back to you, Joan, I, I do hope that Oli can consider, can continue serving as a forum for us to really figure that out for everyone. Well, Kelly, I can say, um, I do believe that we understand our role and we are committed to continuing the conversation and hope that maybe we hear from others um, at some point, hopefully next week, um, about their thoughts on, on what they've learned and how they might be able to continue. Um, I see Dr. Mundy's head shaking. <laughs> yeah, should. no, I mean, I, I think that was so well said. It's hard for me to say anything after that, but um, I, I think, it would it just highlighted the importance of Oli Foundation as kind of that neutral body to keep the conversation going and keep innovating. And I, I think, you know, right now this is focused on entral, uh, the entral tubes, I mean, and fit in particular or those that meet the ISO standard, but we still need to innovate regarding formulas, right? There's so much else in the home enteral nutrition community that we could do better. Uh, so I just hope that this kind of continues and uh, raising awareness, especially with coverage and, and Congress and uh, those kind of regulations uh, would just be a tremendous benefit that came out of this. Uh, so I'm hoping we are able to kind of get energized and fight for our community, our enteral community and, and keep this going so it sort of lifts all boats, you know, that kind of thing. Um, so again, thank you for the opportunity. Yeah, I, I wanna thank uh, thank you, Dr. Mundy and, and Dr. Cap, uh, Tappington. I'd like to give a nod to the only staff who's worked beyond beyond any expectation to help coordinate this in, in a two week period. <laughs> But um, yeah, and, and I want, I, I just thank all of the participants for, for tuning in and, and spending the time with us and contributing.